I've shortened our presentation, but I've packed a lot into each slide. By shortening, by shortening it, we can get a lot more done in the nitsy bitsy amount of time on one slide. What I want to start out doing today is the basics. It, it began to occur to me after all these years that to set it up um, in a way that it, I had tried in prior times to set it up in a way that the process flowed. However, that was faulty thinking because not everybody starts out knowing that from the point that they're going to travel and, and the next part, they don't necessarily go next to an advance or the next thing to, um, you know, something else. So I realized that the two basic parts of our travel are the justification memo and the C-676C. We all get our, um, <coughs> some people make the decision that they're going to travel. Some people get told that they're going to travel. Um, maybe there's another way, I don't know. But whatever the circumstances, travel has to have two documents um, without, if nothing else happens, two documents have to begin it. The very first document, I would think, we used to, th I used to think in terms of the C-676C, but now, since travel has to be very critical for a person to, to go and do it, or for it to be one of those things that we can't do, um, you know, E, E, whatever they call it, WebEx or <coughs> electronically have the, the conference or whatever, we resort to going. So, whenever we realize that we're, we need to travel, the very <coughs> first thing we do is determine why is this travel mission critical. Most of the time, it's because you really do need a face-to-face -face with that person, or you really need a face-to-face -face with a large group. WebEx, those, those electronic ways are wonderful, but um, bottom line, many times, you can't reach a person nearly as well that way as you can by traveling. So, that being said, one of the first things I want to point out is the protocol for to and from. I, we frequently get justification memos and the secretary administrative assistant, the person who completes the justification memo will put their name from Brenda Morris to <coughs> Miss Elisa. Well, actually, I should not have my name there, but Miss Winifred or Miss Pam would be the ones giving me the permission or asking permission from Miss Elisa for me to travel. So keep in mind that yes, I'm a part of it, but I'm a small part at this point. So for those of you who may be admin assistants or and I'm not sure, I don't I don't have a clue what people's jobs job um, titles are. But these two things are very important. Um, then, of course, it always comes through the Cheryl. The, the other dates, etc. you know, we don't usually have a problem with those. 
one of the things that some people will do though is they will put their name there and then there's never a supervisor who initials there and um, LaCheryl will not have, in other words, they just print it off in Trump net. Also, um, yeah, I've, and I've, I've shown that from to and via budget manager. And always in blue, and they are so good to me. All of these, oh, and That's I do me, that. I do that. <laughs> Okay, all of these folks in that those first three lines have, um, you know, they have put their initials out there usually on the ones that are going to be used. Sometimes I'm sure that there are snafus that happen everywhere. I apologize if I'm in somebody's way while I'm trying to do this. Um, the following information is provided in accordance with Chapter 2013-41. Laws of Florida, Senate Bill 1502, Section 48. Now, how many of you folks know that at the end of this legislative season, those numbers are going to change? Yes. We do. Yeah, we do. change the form. <laughs> um, but IT loads that information for you they usually load it in the month of <coughs> June as soon as they get the information funneling down from the legislature they go ahead and load this on there so if you go out to pull one off of the intranet um, be sure that those numbers are correct and always make sure that we have managers, people in management who have signed or who have, you know, done their little initials and said it's okay. This and on this one, the mission critical nature of travel is very, you know, it's very short in comparison to some of the ones we get, usually from um, counselors that travel every day, okay? So if this one just is uh, succinct, which is a lot of them that come from here. The program resource section provides needed support, training, da -da, and training section is designed to expand knowledge of counselors, certified business, etc. These are important as well. All of this information here comes from knowing where you're going to fund this travel from. This information on here will reflect the information on your C six seven six C. Sorry. Um. <laughs> I think I want to go to the All right. city. Each year, each year. Each year. Each year. Uh, uh, yes, the, I, the forward arrow in my board. Uh, uh, is this forward? Yes. Unless I'm clicking at the wrong thing. Right. Just let me okay. Know. And I don't remember where you're supposed to, but you, you know. Okay. All right. Uh oh. Benefits to the state, mission critical nature of travel are the same. So when you go back to this one, I'm sorry, y'all. Please forgive me. It's just because you're getting used When to you them. go back to this one, you will see that the information right here and the information right here are the same. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to go back to the previous slide just to make sure I understand correctly. Do we, are we from, when you say it's from the supervisor, is it the immediate supervisor or the bureau chief? Usually it would be the bureau chief or it actually depends. If the, bureau, if the uh, immediate supervisor is sending it to the bureau chief, that's one thing. And I don't, I'm not sure all of the levels of how you folks have to do those things over here. But by and large, I would think that it would go to, you know, Miss Elisa. But it may not. No, it will. I'm saying from if I'm doing it for someone else in 
my unit will the firm be my immediate supervisor? Correct. Okay. Not yeah. not my bureau chief. Right. Like if you're traveling, is that what you're saying? If you're no, traveling if, or if I'm um, doing the paperwork for someone else. Do you I'm not familiar with how your pool is it a pool of people? I'm not familiar with actually how that works. Uh, but apparently you must do some travel for several individuals and so what you would be doing that one individual has said would you do a justification memo for me to go to right such and such and you if the person for whom you're doing the C676C is themselves are themselves um, a bureau chief you would use there. But, you know, if they were not a part, some part of management, they would not normally have their name. They would not normally go straight to Miss Elisa. You know, it wouldn't necessarily go straight to Elisa. But if you have Okay, that's confusing. Yeah. Easy, easy, easy. <laughs> I, I guess if I am, like if I'm doing it for myself, I totally understand that I would put from Stephanie Wilson to Miss Elisa. Okay. Um, Who's one of the other for, people you would do it for? If I would do it for our facilities manager. His boss, would I put his boss at, in the firm or would I put my boss? So you're talking about Trent? Right. If I were doing so if you were doing it for Trent, <coughs> correct. then who would it be from? Would it be from Trent or, or would it be from Susan Whitmire, who was his supervisor? Susan would need to be asking for okay. permission from Miss Elisa for Trent to travel. So it's that person's supervisor. Right. So Susan will have to do all of them. Yeah, most of them I would expect the bureau chief to have to do. Do you have some of those same instances, um, Nancy? Yeah, I do the same thing. So, yeah. but when I do it for you, you don't do Susie. I mean, you don't do Susie for Julie and all. Um, yeah. Oh, you don't put Susie. That's right, because I was going so I would put Julie's name. Julie, Because, yeah. yeah. I mean, Alicia is y'all. Mm -hmm. Julie, um, hey. Yeah, oh, see, yeah. Uh, Alicia yeah. is her. So it could be from Julie. So yeah, it would be from Julie to Miss Elisa. Yes. But the main thing beyond that, the other main thing, I guess, would be to tell you, please, that what is here and what is back over on this for the mission critical statement needs to be the same. Now, little Angel and I worked and worked and worked to make that long one that has to be done sometimes fit into that space. Um, bottom line is, sometimes you just have to type it into that space. Um, yeah, there, there's issues with some of the forms. Definitely. And um, But we can talk about that later. Catherine, yeah. you want updating forms now mm -hmm. on this? Okay, then we can talk about a way maybe to fix it where they can copy and paste it. Okay. okay. But I mean, it, it didn't work when we were doing it from the website, mm -hmm. but I'm, I, we can talk about that later and fix it since okay. it's in house. Okay. Steph, there's, there's a chair here. I don't want you got to go, go in now. Okay. I don't want to go in front of the camera. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you, you're tiny enough, you could just crawl right over the camera. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you for coming, Steph. Okay. Um, the, some of the other things are whenever any changes to any of these documents get made after they've been approved, <coughs> they need to be done in, you mark through them, you never wipe out anything. Not for us. We want to see a mark through it. We want to see that you knew it was there and we're going to know it was there and that, you know, white out tends to say just what it does. It pretends like it wasn't there, but we want to know what was there and we want to know what you're putting there. We need to know. Um, the other thing is many times, I don't know that I've ever had this statement come from headquarters, 
uh, but I do get it from the field, or we do, see justification memo down here in this. You know, well, that's just not acceptable. Um, so somehow we need to strive to make it happen, even if that means we need to work on you know, our forms and stuff. Indicate how the tribal benefits the state. Mostly I get how it benefits you. Well, I'm going to this training, um, I'm going to this mandatory training, it usually says something like that, and um, I, I will, my, my skills will be enhanced so that I can um, type faster, run faster, climb faster, you know, whatever, but we're, it's not about how it benefits us. It is about how it benefits the state. So if you're going to tell us that your skills will be um, enhanced, improved, whatever the word is, tell us how having your skills enhanced is going to um, benefit the state. If your skills are going to be better at um, doing presentations, then that means when you return and you process your own transport um, presentations, that will benefit the state because you will be able to provide all of the information that you've just brought back from this conference to everybody in your office. That's very many times we see that one person will go because um, they want that one person to come back and teach. So that's a great way to benefit the state is to come back and teach what you learned. Um, I've already talked about it being in Blue Week with the date of the change and with the supervisor's initials and date. And of course, I've already talked about the white out to Brenda. start through it. Brenda, okay. you said do not use white out after it's been approved. I don't yeah, like white out at all, Debbie. Okay, you so know? even if it's before the director has approved an assignment, do not use it or the tape and just mark through it. You know, I change. Wouldn't, I, I really wouldn't. Okay. I, you know, I would think, now I may be wrong, but I would think that Miss Elisa would want to know what was there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just checking. Before, yeah. I, if I were in, in Miss Elisa's shoes, I would want to know what they had asked for before. Plus, and, it takes yeah. away the the guesswork for Brenda. She doesn't have to know when why that was applied after it was approved or before. She couldn't just look at it and see it's been marked through an initial. Right, and that and that nobody was hiding anything. And who should make the initials? The individual so making the change the or the traveler. Traveler. And the, the, if the person <clears throat> marks through it and makes their initials and date, that's fine. But the person that approves it ultimately I don't think that it should get through Miss Elisa's office without it being corrected. If it's on the other end that it gets corrected, when it gets back, you know, then still the supervisor of the person who initiates asking it to be corrected should initial and date your initials for us. Okay. That way we know that one person did not increase their amount, you know, to travel when they really they were supposed to only use a hundred dollars and they use five hundred. You know, we we really need that dealt with before it ever gets to us and dealt with persons above the travel. Okay, see if I can move this baby forward. Uh oh. Where's the other? Oh, I have to Okay. So here we go with our advance. This one may look, it looks like it's been written in, in in some of these places, but it actually wasn't. It was because it was pressed down hard. So I apologize that there are some, looks a little messy in some places, but at any rate, um, application for advance, the C676TA, 
Many travelers believe that when they ask for an advance that they get 100% of whatever they think that it's going to cost them. Um, frequent callers say, why did I get all I asked for? But that's the reason, because we refigure and we make sure that it's no more than 80% of the approved estimated expenses. Um, we also have to make sure that they don't have an outstanding advance, that they've not settled. Um, and it has to be, they can only have Florida statutes require that only one advance per person per time, okay, each time. And you have to settle it within, there's some depends in here. You have to settle it within three days or five days. You settle it within three days if you owe us money. You settle it within five days if we owe you money, okay, for your traveler. That's the difference. It's three and five, and it needs to be all the way through its process and back to our office within those five days, and we know that's impossible, but as closely after five days as possible. But again, if you do owe money, um, three days gets me. And this, and this includes consultants and board members or council members or <coughs> anybody in general? It includes them, but you know, again, we, I tell you what the statutes tell us, and I tell you that I, we know that there are others with outside mitigating circumstances, FRC members, uh, council members, um, those folks that are traveling in that commission, that's, that's different, you know. So yeah, we know that there are always those. But another thing that um, we have found, that I have found, um, many of the people who are in FRC um, Nia stays on, on contact, in contact with those people, and she knows when it's coming. And she'll send us an email that can go in their file, that does go in their file, so that we know, okay, they haven't just gone out there and forgotten it, uh, Nia's on top of this. So, so I would say to you that if you can't get it to us in, in that three to five day window, at least send us an email so that we put it in their file. That also means that if I'm out, since I do all advances, if I'm out and Miss Bishop goes to look at my log about an advance because somebody's called, Miss um, Bishop can look at the log and say, well, that advance hasn't been settled. I can see that Miss Brennan's made this note, that note, the other note. So, you know, she then has the information to let other people know what's going on. Um, Nia. Um, I have a question. Is there an exact criteria for um, requesting in advance? Um, an exact criteria. I, I ask because it's been yeah. more of a request and um, sometimes it seems like it's um, as a prepayment, and I know where they get the reimbursements after. So, I always thought they had to not have access to a credit card. I mean, I, I mean that really could be outdated because it's been a while since yeah. I've actually done travel. Yeah. Um, you can't have a P card. That's one reason to not be able to give an advance. You have a P card. It's an automatic, you ought to know you don't. Um, and yes, I, I understand that there are people who say, well, I don't want to wait for my reimbursement. I want it now. Can I control that? No. Not unless Ms. Bishop tells me I can. <laughs> and I don't think that she would say that unless Ms. Pam had a reason that we couldn't, you know, I, there, there are many things I cannot control, but <coughs> if, it's sad that that's how people feel, but I, I do understand that that happens. Okay. Thank you.
Yes, we are. Um, okay. I don't know. I think that probably this is. Yeah. We can talk about this here. Travelers who abuse the privilege, lose the privilege. If you are eternally late sending in your paperwork for, well, number one, to get your advance, I need that advance paperwork 21 days before your first day of travel or their day of travel. Now, that is for my ability to process. Sometimes, you know, I'm processing a huge training with a hundred advances or, or more. Maybe I'm processing several trainings with that many advances. There are times when advances are very heavy. So if you get yours to me 21 days in advance, then I have time to audit it, take care of everything that needs to be taken care of, tell you if you need to give some more information, um, whatever. I have time to do that. If you continually, you, I don't mean you, but if a person continually waits until the last minute and then they want to scan it in to somebody and then they want that somebody to run up and down the halls trying to get some um, signatures on it here and they do that time and again, now, nah, it's just me, but I think this is abuse. That's abusing not only our office, but your office and your people too. If that, if it happens sometimes, and I know there are many times that people find out at the last minute, and we understand that, but we are not supposed to work in our office from scanned copies. We are supposed to have original documents and waiting until two days before a trip to start trying to get you people to do what they should have done. Well, it's just not, you know, it's not ever going to teach most people to do that. So um, I can say that it has gotten better. And that may be because travel isn't done so much right now. But for whatever reason, if, if that happens, I see that as an abuse. But by and large, abusing means that if they just wait and wait and wait to send it in, um, and they do that not just once, but time after time, how many times is enough? That is abusing. Or if you continually have one and then you send in another one and ask another one for another one before you get this one done, that's abuse as well. So those who abuse it can lose it. We do keep records of, of the ones who do this. Um, the only other thing I would tell you is estimated per diem cost on an advance is not allowable. This amount is your last day of, or is a person's last day of per diem. It is not an expense. All of your expenses at that point have been your have been your food, your lodging, your transportation. All of those expensive expenses have been dealt with. So we get 80% of all of that. So filling the per diem amount in is not it's not going to help. We're only going to mark it off. I'm going to mark it off and pay the rest, 80% of the rest. 80% of the, the real expenses. If for some reason you, your person does not go on their trip, this is one of those times where the money has to come back the day that that person learns they are not going on that trip, that's the day that that money is due, period. And there's three days beyond that that you have for them to send it in. So 
It's not like, but I already spent it, and I'll have to wait until my paycheck. So hopefully we don't find too many in that in that position, but it has happened. Do they write personal checks back to the state? Is that it is personal it? checks. Okay. Personal checks are money orders, cashier's checks. Uh, if someone does their paperwork way in advance, 30 days in advance, and they may find out a week after the paperwork's been submitted that they're not going to go, do we just call you then? Is it that has it already been processed to be provided to them? No, okay. if you've sent it 30 days in advance, that only means that I've had the opportunity to really, you know, take care of that person. Um, but Again, statutes dictate that we cannot um, enter their information for that check to be cut or that EFT to happen more than 14 days in advance, and that's calendar days, not business. So that would be 14 calendar days or two business days. So my PD has, you know, it um, mirrors that. 14 days before is when I start putting their stuff in, okay? So you have up until that time to reach. And it's better if you send an email. I can just tuck that in. Everybody knows then why they didn't get their advance, okay? Any other questions? <coughs> when y'all get ready for a break, let me know. I'm, real, I'm not real good at watching that clock. <laughs> okay. I called Miss Jan and I asked for permission to use her um, voucher, taking care of all her sensitive information, of course. Um, and this was her P card when she did a P card recently, and. When I talked to her about the actual lodging expense, you can see that it shows zeros. Um, airfare shows zeros. Of course, she didn't use airfare, but you know, had she done that, she would have needed, or, or a person needs to have the words P card in there. Um, what happened was, in the notes, P card was used to pay for lodging and embassy, rental car at Avis, and the purchase of gasoline supplies. Please see second page of reimbursement request. Returned rental on the 27th at no additional charge to the state at L Peoples, Florida. Um, this is an excellent way to recover. If you get to that point and you go, <sighs> but this also, and, and Angel's going to show us at this point what one would do to get the word P-card here and the word P-card there if need be. Now over here, you know, you would write Avis P-card, something like that. But um, that was something I didn't mention in the beginning was for Angel to go through each one of these steps with me would take a humongous amount of time. She is, however, are you, are you going to show them at this point how to get P card on there where they? I can, sure. Um, we can hop in there real quick. Now I don't know how many of you folks. I, I can't hop into my computer. I, you know, I just. <laughs> oh, all right. At my age. <laughs> um, but this is what going into your computer. If you are a traveler or your people are travelers, this is what you see. And um, it was not until some of the uh, ladies who helped me, you, they could not understand what the people are asking. The people call and say, the travel program says thus and such. I, I don't know what to do at this point. So by going through some of these, you'll see that, you know, it is sort of difficult for them to understand. Yeah, it's kind of washing it out a little bit. You literally um, would just type in your information and you can use the tab key 
to go all the way across and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this screen because I don't want to take away from Brenda. However, anybody that needs to schedule travel training, if you want to have some actual travel training on the program, um, just email me and if I have two or three people interested, we'll go ahead and set up another one. Uh, but the main thing I do want to show you here, now y'all know how to fill that part in because otherwise you wouldn't have anything printed. But if someone actually had lodging expenses that needs to go on the back of the form for P-Card, then what you normally would do is you would actually type P-Card here in the field. You literally type that. So that on that screen that Brenda had up just a second ago, it doesn't say zero for airfare because, I mean not airfare, I'm sorry, but for lodging. Because if they went and they stayed and they're doing meals and all this kind of stuff, you know that they're somewhere or they've got to stay somewhere Okay, so this is where you would put P-Card. Or if they paid for it out of their airfare, you would put P-Card here. And literally all you do is just type it. Now this one is not really gonna let me do a good example. I just want you to see that you can type the word P-Card in there and it will accept it. That's what I want to see on the front of a travel voucher that lets Brenda know without the note, okay, that go to the second page for P-Card information. And, and to get to the P card. And the P card information is different. Now, again, most of you guys know this because I've trained most of y'all over here anyway on it. Um, but let me show you where you would go to for it. You would actually have to click on the expense button. Notice there's there's trip and expense and there's trip and there's expense. Normally when I'm teaching it, I make you guys learn how to go straight into the trip and expense. But if you need to put in a P-card information, you have no choice but to go to the expense information. That is the only place that you can get to the actual choice of a P-card payment, okay? That's the only place you can get to it to actually choose P-card and then put all the information in. So you have to go to the expense button once you get it. When they're in this page, do they pick their own object codes? They have a choice of object codes, okay? You see how they're laid out? Yeah. And sometimes they pick the wrong one. Yeah, I get that a lot. Yeah, yes, they absolutely do pick the wrong one sometimes. But you, so you do need to pay attention to it. Now, most of the time, it's going to be hotel and stay, all right? It, usually, it's going to be hotel or airfare and stay. I mean, you guys know when you're looking at it. But it's just one of those things that it's easy to just choose the wrong one and not be paying attention to it. Not to mention there's one that's like, what is it, your regular 261010, yeah. which a lot of stuff falls under. But if it's airfare or if it's hotel, you want to choose those object codes, okay? You do want to pay attention to those object codes and try to choose the rest of the best one. But, you know, the system is only as good as, I mean, when they first started designing it, and I know some people hate it, it works, but it's not necessarily user friendly. But um, Th these were not there. We didn't have to separate hotel and airfare. We had to add that after the program had already been built. So it's got some little issues with it. In fact, key cards weren't available when it was done. So P there wasn't even a, a way to add it. It had to be kind of, the field had to be added afterward. So that's kind of, so this one we don't limit. You're, you're gonna have to depend on people to choose the right one and, under, yeah. and understand what they're doing. Yeah. It appears that most people don't know what to use for parking and... That's usually just 2610. I know, but I've got advanced. I've gotten... Oh, no, 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 that's stuff. terrible. And, you know, maybe the supervisors need to be trained a little bit better on that, too, just to kind of keep an eye on it, you know, to see that it says the right work code. Okay? Actually, the other day, um, Charlotte brought one to me because there were some tolls, which is 261010. But they had been coded to 26 9000, which is the advanced yeah. object code. So when 26 9000 gets down there in that lineup of object codes, that could create a problem. And it's gonna, um, I'm sure that since Shauna caught it, that she changed it. However, if, you know, if somebody didn't catch it, then that 26 9,000 is gonna, that particular one was an area director's uh, travel, um, and that person has a P card. So 26 9,000 showing up under that area director's 
name will not, you know, will not look good. So I have to deal with that this week. Um, but I would not have known had Charlotte not brought that one to my attention. But we do deal with a lot of misapplied um, um, object codes. So just be, you know, be aware, especially when you're trying to um, pull down the correct object code for your other expenses. And here. one thing I do want to point out that at least the travel program does it really well for travel, like mileage and um, meals, it separates out, right. and then the regular one. And again, there's one for per diem as well. So this part, you don't have to worry about breaking out. That's right. If you put it in the column that says per diem, it pulls that object code for you. So you guys don't have to worry about that. But when you're on that P card screen, you need to pay attention to the choices of object codes and choose, try to the best of your ability to choose the correct one. Okay. Okay. Other questions before we leave the screen? Of course, this is just the back side of the um, travel voucher. Um, the card charges on back plus the reimbursement amount from the front of the C676 um, will be equal to or less than the total amount approved on the C676C. List charges singularly, please. Um, list parking at the hotel on a separate line. We need the charges listed singularly because when you lump them off, or when they are, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say y'all do these things, but when they are clumped together especially, um, then we have, we go in and we dissect and try to pull out the pieces that we think belongs to that total amount. Um, so it you know it takes a whole lot more time. We're not opposed to you know spending as much time as we need to on a voucher, but when we're doing when we're taking an hour on one voucher, that means that the next person that we would get to would be waiting extra time. You know, and I might not get them in that day and they might be a really important person or who knows, you know? Who knows, but anyway, just please list charges singularly. But you don't mean they have to break down the hotel. You mean like like they wouldn't have to say the first day no, for no, the hotel. No. No. Okay, that's no. okay. You just want the hotel the and group if there's separate. parking, tell us, you know, on another line, parking and the amount. On another line, you can put the gasoline. You've got two amounts for gasoline, you know. So you can actually, she did Exxon and Gate, looks like. Uh, so she did parking on, I mean, um, gasoline on two separate lines. But the, the main thing is that we don't, we try not to um, lump embassy suites with their valet parking amounts and so forth and so forth. Because <laughs> valet parking then requires a, um, justification. Besides that, the valet parking may push the embassy suites into the $100 <coughs> category, and if that happens, you know, then there's something else that has to happen, which we'll get to. So. And, and probably the easiest thing also to remember is per receipt. Like if you have two separate receipts for um, gasoline, then you want to do an entry for each receipt. That Does that help? That could help. Because like you can embassy suites, you would, you know, unless they went to another hotel, you wouldn't have another receipt for the hotel for that. So right. that might help a little. Right. But if you do go to two different hotels, then you do have to go to them. Then you do. Okay. This is your per diem um, clock. Our pie chart. Okay. Our okay. pieces of pie. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, I've always said there are two different kinds of per diem. Regular per diem and straight per diem. Um, regular is when you go and you get meals, lodging, and transportation, of course, and the last day of your per diem of regular, per, uh, straight per diem on the last day. But 
all of this here is, that's what means lodging and meals. That's what per diem means, per day. Straight per diem is the clock from midnight. Per diem, by the way, starts at midnight. Midnight to 6 a.m. is one quarter. Six to noon is another. Noon to six is another. And six to midnight again is another. Now, if a person travels in any, say we, you know how on the last night, um, the lodging is paid for and the person comes back and they get however many quarters they traveled in, 60, 80, however much it is, depending on the quarters. That means that on that last night, the state of Florida paid the hotel for them to sleep until they got up the next day at, you know, six, seven o'clock, whatever time it was, they paid for the, we paid for the hotel, the state did. And also at midnight, if it's the last day, their last day of per diem started, okay? That's why we count this quarter, this quarter, and this quarter if they got back before 6 p.m. And we claim this quarter if they come back after 6 p.m. So they can literally get four quarters on the last day even though they spent the night at the hotel. So. Bear that in mind. Um, there isn't a whole lot of people who do not get this anymore, but it, this used to really confuse people, that pie chart, as, as Angel called it. Um, this used to really get people. So I'm, I'm thinking everybody in here probably understands this. Now, or we're going to expect that to be right. I, I, have, I do have a question on the lodging. You mentioned they have $150. Mm -hmm. I've been asked, show me. Okay. Is, there, is it in the it's statutes? It's in the manual. Is it, it in the statutes? Um, I don't know that it's in the statutes, but it was a VR decision that our lodging was still, there was a time that it, you know, was 100 um, then it, VR, it, well, everybody in the state bumped it up to 150. When others in the state bumped it up, if you will, the director at that time said, we will not bump it up. VR will remain at 150, and that's before tax. If it's one, you know, if it's 157, we all, we're going to get to the magic phrase that you'll use for that justification. Um, or if you're in a hotel, if your people are in a hotel where it's more than that, um, then you, you will have a justification. But by and large, and especially I guess in our budget crunch, nothing has really been discussed that I know of about increasing <laughs> the, um, the threshold um, you know, for that $150. <coughs> $150 per night hotel. <laughs> Does everybody remember the magic phrase? I got it on here. <laughs> I imagine everybody in here has it. Um, Probably hasn't memorized. Yeah. You're going to show them how to put it in? Well, it has to go in the notes field, and I'm not sure I can actually show it in here without Fine. doing one, but I think I might have one on one line. Um, well, okay. If you don't have it exactly, I have it in here exactly. Good, if you have it exactly. And um, this is where it needs to go, and if you say hotel um, or lodging expense greater than $150 without the decimal, I mean, it really, uh, and a lot of times what will happen is you'll get an error message when you're trying to submit it. 
And if you look at the error message down here, it's going to say lodging expense over $100, and it's not going to have the decimal, 150, sorry, not going to have the decimal points. If you make sure that you put it exactly as the same as the error message, and you type that in the green area, then you'll be fine. But that's the problem. Is at one time, you know, some of us put decimals and some of us don't, and when we designed it to catch the error, it has to say lodging expense. Not hotel, it has to say lodging. So. I cut it out and put it on the top of my browser. Yay, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, let me get back to your next screen. Okay. okay. Um, not 
hit the look up button and allow the look up to put it in for you, the asterisk will appear. We will check it if there's an asterisk there. We will double check to make sure about these miles being correct. Does anybody need me to show you how to put that in? You know, or hit the look up key and what she's talking about. But I mean, it's, it's on the screen. And if it's Tampa to Orlando, you know, you do have to spell it right, okay? So if you type Orlando in wrong or something, it's not going to find that mileage for you. But as long as you type it right, you can look it up and you don't have to worry about going to MapQuest and find the right map mileage. But occasionally there are cities that you might have to look up in MapQuest and Brenda will tell you how to do that. You know, I'm wondering too, like this Tampa to Brandon, that one would be very easy to say Tampa to Brandon, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that one would be very easy to get. Yeah, so you do have to make sure you're typing it right. Right. Um, but in the field, these are issues. Do Is there anybody in here who has a problem with discerning those kinds of mileages. I don't I don't remember that, you know, that that that, that is something that goes on here. But you know, we're this part of the world is different. Almost everything is map mileage, isn't it? Well there are times like if Catherine is doing somebody else's or OJ is doing somebody else's travel voucher, they may have just given them the odometer, the tripometer reading, okay? But when you're doing it, you're going to have to sit there and say, okay, from Tampa to Orlando is so many miles, or Tallahassee to Orlando is so many miles according to the lookup table. And then you're going to have to sit there and you're going to have to subtract, okay, what she gave you so that you can come up with the vicinity miles to put in the other column. Do not lump them together. They will get turned down and the traveler will lose their vicinity miles. This is what Angel's talking about. The mileage is reimbursed for privately owned vehicles, 0.445 cents per mile. Um, to look up map mileage, always start with this DOT web address. Not everything is in there. Um, you know, Tallahassee to Monticello is in there. Um, I can't think of, you know, some places right now that that aren't in there. Right, not too A. Right, not too A. You're right. <laughs> but but go here first to look up map mileages, and then if if you do have an odometer reading, that's one thing. But you still need to look. You use MapQuest to compute the mileage not found at this web address up here above, and you always use the shortest distance option. The reason that you do that is because, number one, you're required to take the least expensive route. Now, I know that most people take the one that's the fastest, but on our paperwork, we need to show the shortest distance option. Then, anything that's above that short distance object it's not that they're lost you put that into their vicinity mileage okay unless it's some gosh awful amount and then we have to find out what's going you know something must have gone awry they got lost they um, that would be me okay i've, I've done that it that would be me <laughs> lost is where i usually am uh so so if they start with odometer, that's fine. But break it down. Don't just put that. And there's there's a certain few, um, not here, that will put 520 miles on the very last line. And that's for everything they did that month, folks. And that is not a good thing to do. Um, so that's, that's another one of those lumping ideas is, to lump all the miles together. And we don't know what 520 miles went to. Nia? Is that three supposed to be there by the WWW? Uh-huh. Yeah, that I've seen that come up a few times before. But also, let me just point one thing out to you guys. 
if it shows up in the mileage table, you don't have to go look it up. Okay. If you look it up. Yeah, if you look it up, if you can look up in the travel program, you're okay. But this is like for those weird ones that you didn't find, if it hadn't been updated or something for some weird reason. And and I think it's easier just to go to MapQuest, but if, I think Brenda's trying to make y'all at least check it there to make sure it's not there. Right, why you, yeah, this is what is supposed to be the acceptable standard. DOT map mileage, which is what this But website. the only thing I want to say about that, Brenda, is that that's supposed to be updated into the program. Mm -hmm. And occasionally it may not have been updated right. recently. And if it hasn't, and you guys that travel catch it, and say, oh, wait a second, they've changed it from uh, Tallahassee to Orlando, and now it's two extra miles or something, or two less miles. If you guys will let somebody in the IT section know, then they'll go replace that database. Mm -hmm. Because they'll, you know, they'll just randomly do it. They've added new roads or improved new roads or something, so they've changed it. So if y'all come across dates that aren't matching up, if y'all let us know, we can correct that. You can send an email to that VRIT work order. Um, normally, well, just recently I had a fellow from Tampa, I think it was, and he was a fairly new employee. And he went from X to X um, on a very regular basis during the week. And neither one of those X's were in the program. So he wrote me and asked me, okay, what do I do? I said, well, you know, normally we talk to Terrence. Let's send Terrence an email. So I took the information and I sent it to Terrence. And Terrence then responded to the traveler and to me about what he needed. He went ahead, entered all the information in, and the man's life was a piece of cake then as far as getting his mileage done. So they're very responsive, I found. Um, sometimes, you know, you may have a difficulty finding the right person, but <laughs> normally, I, I mean, when I tell the people out in the field, get in touch with such and such, I have found they're very responsive. So if there are some mileages like you were saying, two egg and um, Cottondale probably are yeah. in that. Especially like me and with you, like you've got some people in particular that repeatedly travel. If they're leaving from a town that's not listed, we can get those added for you. Yeah. Oh, right. great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And that's that's the best thing. Oh, well, not that's not so the that best thing. So you don't have to always go over to MapQuest and get it. Right. It can just automatically be entered in. Okay. Um, I've had some excellent questions during the um, intermission, and um, Joe had several questions that he posed. Um, so if you want to just ask me, and we can, I can just share it with everybody. <coughs> um, the per diem one is that. On the per diem question, I asked, I was like, um, how is it reported if you travel with the state of private residence? Oh, you know, like a family or friends, wherever you travel to, how's that reported? Um, when we were at this slide, and people stay using straight per diem, if you travel to an area and you have friends in the area, who own, you know, who own their home, whatever, you want to stay with your friends and attend this conference. You um, are eligible, that traveler is eligible to use the straight per diem clock for their amount per day. They, will re they would be required to go into the notes section and in the notes section of the travel voucher, well, forward, forward, um, where Miss Jan put um, put this information, if she had done straight per diem here for for the two days, she would have said here stayed with friends in the area, um, straight per diem requested. No meals, um, 
no additional <coughs> lodging. However, if Miss Jan had gone and she and you know somebody else who might have been doing travel with her to teach or whatever it was that they, they did, um, if they shared a room, uh, it used to be more frequent that one would think that they could claim straight for them and one would think that they paid for the room. Well, you can't do that. Um, one person, either one person pays for the room and two people lodge together or you can have the bill split and both people pay. But you can't let one person have per diem, straight per diem, and one person um, share a room with somebody um, and call that per diem or with a friend or something. And Joe's question was, okay, how do we ensure that they stay with a friend or whatever private residence? We can't ensure that. But that traveler will say in these notes that I stayed with ex-friend and therefore am requesting only straight for him. Or private residence or something. Yeah. They do have to tell us that it is a private residence. Stay with private residence with a friend, you know, maybe they've got a home there or, you know, whatever. Um, and they the need to tell us here, and at that point, that is our our responsibility has just stopped. It's their responsibility. The burden of proof is upon them. And when the other auditors, I hope that people understand that we are not the last people who see travel vouchers. We're only a part of the beginning of that of that. Um, trip through the system for a travel voucher and we do our best to make sure that those who travel for us never have to worry about having to answer questions from somebody else but if a person does not tell the truth about their per diem once we have it here that they stayed in a private residence with friends or whatever then we can't go beyond that. The burden of truth and truth is on them. Um, there was one other thing, Joe, that was that I had wanted to bring up and had slid on by it. It was just one of the events that they were trying to um, how you were doing that, and I was like, you don't get that for the key card, you said you didn't receive the key card because uh, that would be covered on those charges. Right. Um, he was wondering why, when they're, um, like she has the P card here, or that she has the, um, in, the, in the mileage area, why didn't she have the mileage there, he said. Well, because when you rent a vehicle, the mileage is on, the, on that vehicle and we pay for the gasoline. Or you know, they get reimbursed for the gasoline. So they wouldn't get mileage there unless they claim a few vicinity miles to the airport or down to the Ace place or, you know, whatever that is. But no mileage normally goes there unless it is just to run get the uh, Avis vehicle. So we wouldn't necessarily have miles to think about here. Um, but it's more than, oh, and the other thing is if they're not doing a P card or if they are, but you get somebody and everything is empty here and you look on the back and there's nothing about a card or something there and you go, well, how they do that? So you have to ask them, um, why don't you have any miles indicated? That's when they will tell you, oh, I wrote to so-and-so. It's to saying all of that up front. I will tell you from my times of preparing travel vouchers, your toughest work is before you actually start that program. If you will make your notes, if you will go to whoever you're preparing a voucher for, and you will ask them all the questions
that you know you're going to need. I don't know how it's done here, but sometimes in, um, in a voucher, we get a list and the person will have written to their administrative assistant and they would say, I left that thus and such. Um, I picked a car up at, at this place and, and at this time I uh, left there, picked up so and so and so and went on to thus and thus. Well, if, if when you look those notes over, you're likely gonna have some questions of your own. You go, well, um, you, pick, you picked up the car at say seven o'clock but you didn't actually, you're telling me on, on this note that you didn't actually go into travel status until 12.30, so you know, afternoon. So if you didn't actually go into travel status at 12.30, until 12.30, um, then they, there's breakfast and lunch that they don't, you know, that they don't, um, that they're not eligible for, and they would be eligible for dinner but you have to ask those questions. That's the only way you're gonna find out. And if you don't know those before you get into fixing one of these for these people, um, then you're gonna to have to stop and go ask. Did you start to say something? Oh, sorry. Anyway, that was my own, I can just tell you that's, that's what happened to me. I'd get there and I wouldn't have my notes. I would have my notes about why so much portage, why this, why that. Oh, wow, okay. So do your leg work up front and it won't take you nearly as long. And it won't take, you know, so many times of, of um, trying to go back to that same person and ask the question. We did this. Yeah, under right there on that www3.gut. Uh -huh. That website wouldn't come up for us. We had to just go to www.gut and just look it up and find that, oh, that, that really? one just wasn't coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We might need to double check that. One if it's a broken link, because that's, anyway, it used to be www.2, and now it's a three, because they revamped some things. They are a three now, but anyway, yeah, we can look it up. If it happens to be, um, outdated, then we'll need to know that so we can send it to all you folks, um, you know, the correct one. Okay. Okay. What am I doing here? We're back on the mission critical statement, and I'm just showing you where, where it goes on the C676C. I like the fact most of you folks do not have to deal with daily travelers, but the more information that we can get on these lines and on these lines, then when some information may be missing on the front side of a voucher, we have something we can look at and pull from, and we won't have to send emails and make phone calls. So be sure to give us as much information on your C676C as you possibly can. Um, make sure everybody has signed and dated here. And make sure that the, make sure this makes sense. And, and I'm, I'm really serious about that because there are times when we do get some um, mission critical pieces that just don't make sense and and it's real important because we can't create that for a person we can't create that for you know somebody that's done it for another person which is another thing if you read this that maybe um, has been done before or you see the mission critical on this on the um, when y'all get when y'all are doing um, the travel, say, in in um, in your group, if you start out doing the C six seven six C and um, justification memo, does that mean that you're the person who's going to be doing also 
the travel when that traveler comes back? Or or does that vary? It varies. So it can go from, I mean, just because you see the beginning doesn't mean you're going to see the ending. So you may not know. Wow. Okay. Tough. That's, that's, that's tough. Um, but I would, uh, I would encourage you to, um, you know, to get with somebody to, to get all the loopholes filled. I don't know. I think I did. I just hit the keyboard again. I'm sorry about that. Is that the next slide? Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going to dive in. The state contract we all know is with Avis. The travelers are required to rent the um, to request the compact car. If you are calling to request the car, please don't try to say A, B, C, you know, because that's they. Their A's and B's and whatever's are different from ours. Just tell them you want a compact car. Um, that skips through all the red tape. You cannot misunderstand that, I don't think. Exceptions for the compact, we know are multiple passengers, AD accommodations, ADA accommodations. Now, ADA accommodations require numbers that we will get to. Um, just so that the passage or so that the person can be comfortable, that is not an ADA accommodation. Um, we have to we have to be very careful. We have to um, the main thing is when we start our processes and we're going to travel, we do it honoring the request that we travel the most cost effective, the most cost efficient for the state. That's our job. That's the trust that has been given to us. Um, that's the mandate, you know, and, and those who are above us, the authority that's above us, expects us to honor what they've asked. I, th I don't think that's, I don't think that that's too much to ask of us if we're going to travel, that we travel in that manner. So being comfortable, it's, it's important. And I understand that, but it's not an ADA accommodation. So let's try to make arrangements for everybody to be as comfortable as possible, at, you know, carpooling or whatever. But don't give us this saying so so and so can be comfortable as an accommodation. What if somebody actually does have a back problem and has it documented? Then they need to have to still request send, it. Yeah, they will have to send a request to me for an ADA accommodation, and from that point, I will um, move forward to get them a number. If indeed that what they have to provide is is not necessary to me, I'm just the liaison to move it on. But because we are more intricately involved with our people. We know any questions that labor relations may be gonna ask us. Um, Ms. But Brent. if there is, yes ma'am. Um, what if a justification is prepared by their supervisor and signed off requesting them to upgrade from a compact? Is that okay? Well, upgrade from a compact, they would have to give, you know, if it's a reason that is within the normal <clears throat> realm of, that it can be justified. Like, you know, more people, um, more stuff, stuff, yeah. stuff, equipment, you know, when you're going to train or you're taking a lot of people, or, yeah, those kinds of things don't have to have a number. Okay. 
but um, and if it is an illness that you know that causes them to need that, um, they would need to get an ADA number through us and labor relations. Okay, but what on, what if it was only a one-time incident? You know, um, like maybe they've had surgery and they right, okay. right, and they really do not require right. an ADA number. Right. That I mean, I think. I think that, in fact, I believe that anybody who would go to sign that would, would certainly understand that. And they would have that letter. Probably the doctor would document for them the surgery, et cetera. You know, not going into too much detail, but, okay. you know, I think we have to take each one of those, Ms. Um, Bishop, on a case-by-case -case basis. But, yeah, I get, I get where you're coming from. Okay. But it could be dealt with. Yes, ma'am. So you're saying, like I, if some people want to get a bigger vehicle because they feel that they're safer in a bigger vehicle because they're real tall and large and larger and just still having. Do they carpool in the vehicle? No, they, no. Sometimes it's just them, but they just really feel like they need to, they don't like the contact, they don't feel safe. If they do not want to use the compact for their own personal reasons, they need to be willing to pay the extra couple of dollars, which is about what it um, amounts to, $26.50 to $27.50 to, I forget the next level. Um, they can pay the extra dollars themselves to have a larger vehicle. Now, if they're paying for that with a P card, then they will have to provide um, a check. I know that Tracy at one time on, uh, did it this way that they provide a check to her. Now, if that check goes all the way that it's got to come to us, still, if it's for their own personal feeling about their safety, we want people to be safe, but um, they wouldn't need to um, to reimburse the state for the extra couple of dollars. And that's what it boils down to is two bucks okay. per day. And then that justification form that we have to use, I, I haven't seen anything on that. The justification form? The yeah. justification memo? Yeah, yeah you don't put it on the Tracy does here? No, well, Tracy usually attaches what y'all give right. her. Um, and we can use that okay. frequently. However, if it's not a P-card situation that you're going to turn into Tracy, then there, an, an additional memo would need to be attached indicating that that person has chosen to um, use a larger vehicle, reimbursing the state for the additional few dollars. Okay? Check is attached. Okay? <laughs> Um, another thought went through my mind. Maybe it'll come back through. <laughs> um, okay. Any accommodation when making your reservation? Of course, we all know to use this. A 113400. Um, A to C toll. Okay. The last time that I went. Um, to West Palm. For the first time in my life, I saw uh, the toll places where there's no person. So you've got to, you know, you've got to chunk your money in or whatever. Um, and thank goodness at that point, you just chunk the money in. But there, whenever you have a <coughs> sun pass, whenever you have a transponder on a rental car. It is the traveler's responsibility to request that Avis remove or disable their transponder. Or, in my case that day, my transponder had its own off switch. Well, and I knew where off was. You know, I just turned it off, and that was fine. 
I'm reading more and more about, like in areas of Miami and you know closer, you know coming closer, that those people literally are getting to the point that they have no catch place to go through. But the best thing to do is have them turn off or you turn off, or, you know, travel from that transponder. Um, let Avis know that you're doing it. Use cash toll booths anytime that you're using a rental, if at all possible. Keep your receipts. Um, also, on that trip, I found that at the plazas, the rest plazas, um, they actually have slot, you know, the machines. The, I was about to call it a slot machine. Um, you, you know, like you get crackers and cookies and stuff out of. You put money in and buy a sun pass. <laughs> I've never been so amazed in my life. You put money in and they'll spit out a little sun pass for however many dollars you think you're gonna need and you can, you know, you can do that. But then you get a receipt for that. So, you know, you've got something to turn in to get your money back. So it's not like you're left out in the cold for for the time, you know, we all know it's coming. It's gonna come, you got people in, the, in South Florida that can't believe that we, do not have any tolls here until they come here. But you know, we, we're so blessed that we don't have to go through that kind of stuff. But um, you can purchase a sun pass at a service area, or you can use your own personal sun pass account and of course submit that receipt. You get these pieces of information, these receipts, etc., from the DOT website, and it will walk you through the, the paces of, of doing that. We also currently now can go into that back where I showed you that um, that uh, map of Florida. We can go into DOT now and actually verify the information about the tolls that were paid, that can be paid, have to be paid, and can be paid and have been paid. So it's getting to the point where we can see more and more once we learn where they came on to the um, expressway or the, um, what do they call those? Uh, um, anyways, that other, that other word for it. Mm. Is there a limit to how much they can use of the tolls? Like if they, if they have like up to $25 a day or something, do they have to put receipts for every single one of them? Anything over $25, we need, we need a receipt. We for a receipt for everything. Um, uh, what's ran on my mind? Is there a limit on how much they can be reimbursed when it comes to toll? No, as long as they have their receipts. You know, if I mean, receipts tell us what we need to know, um, that they are legitimate. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Or I'm so sorry. If they don't have any receipts, then um, we will pay them up to $25. But again, we can tell, so we wouldn't just pay them $25 if they don't send receipts. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, about the rental car, I have a traveler right now who um, wants to go, is going on a trip, um, and they're going to rent a car you know, you know, during the time that they're working, three days. But then they're going to go off to the end and back on to the end. How should they? So how should they pay for the rental car? Do they need to pay? For, go to you know Avis, pass out, and pay for it, you know, and return the car in and get another car? Or how do you guys want to handle it? Is it on the V card? Um, the, the first three days will be on the V card. Okay. There's no. There is no other way around except going to the Avis place, returning one car, you know, they'll rent the same one likely, but they still have to take that one off of state business and put it onto their own personal car. Okay. Yes. It's, it's a little inconvenient, but I tell you, on and off per diem, we all know that's a nightmare, on and off. But it's can't be helped sometimes. If I can remember what it was I wanted to tell y'all about the Avis, the e-tolls. Oh, 
he told us. The reason that this is important, folks, is because there are some places where you're literally only going to pay 75 cents for a toll. But when you go through that light with the transponder, it will charge you a convenience fee of nothing less than $10, okay? And one time of going through the e-pass um, booth, from that point on, every day that that transponder has that vehicle, it will be also added fees of $2.95 a day. Whether you go through another one or not, just going through that first time turns that transponder into a tattletale. <laughs> <laughs> you did every day, you pay $2.95 plus you pay ten, at least $10 per toll. Per toll. So that's why this is very important. And it's important to, if you don't want to throw in cash, that you figure out how to get you a sun pass at one of the service areas or your people. Is that reimbursable? No. You do, we do not reimburse convenience fees, no. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is noted on those e-toll receipts, because if we know that there's e-tolls involved, we will not pay tolls until we get those receipts. And those receipts tell it all. They tell you exactly how much that we that you're requesting for that day, and exactly how much you would have paid, or, or you know that's being required at that booth. Okay. I wanted to put one on showing a traveler actually going and returning the whole trip they paid for themselves and waited to receive reimbursement. Um, these, are, these are easy compared to doing some of the other travel that you folks have to do. But when the person goes, um, you know, they just tell us, when they leave, where they're going, the time of day they leave, and the time of day they get back. Unless there's on and off per diem, you do not have to tell us every day, or they don't have to tell us every day that, you know, 8 a.m. that night, you know, 10 p.m. or whatever. We only need two times. The day they left and the time they left, the day they came back and the time they came back not the time they left Orlando to get here, but when they got here. That's what we want to know. When did they get here? Back, okay, this is going back a minute, but all the way back to um, wait until the end. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let me see. Here we go. And paid by the travel. You notice on this, if you ever prepare um, travel for people who are non-employees, their object code 26 
and she's this one says that she went out of state because 2623 tells us that she went out of state. 262320 tells us that she went out of state and she's a non-state employee. That 20 on the end tells us that she's a non-state employee. But she didn't actually go out of state. See, she went to Lauderdale. And Lauderdale back to Tallahassee. But her coding, their coding was this, which is incorrect. So that's another one of those situations where when people are doing non-state employees, they frequently do put the twos in the wrong place. You see right here is the only place that it actually got put correctly. 2610, 20. So that's the only one on there that's correct. Y'all want me to show you where that is in the program? Okay. It's at the very beginning page. Um, I have to escape, so I know. For the non-state. Yes. And let's just pretend I'm going to come in here and I'll say I'm going to add me a brand new travel voucher. Um, I think it quit on me because I've been logged out too long. Obviously, I am a state employee, all right, so it defaults to the correct code, but um, there still should be, now this one's going to default for, it's only going to give you the correct codes that you can use for an employee, but if I'm coming in here, let's see, I think with maybe somebody like Ivy or, or even Catherine, you guys can do it as a delegate. And I don't have that choice here, but let me see if it'll let me change somebody else. Maybe I'll pretend like I'm looking up one for TV Amy because I know her. Let's see if it'll let me do it now so I can show you. All right, I'm gonna tell I'm gonna say that I'm adding a voucher for her. And here it defaults to out of state non-employee but you have to choose in-state non-employee. That's just one of those weird things that, and Ka Terrence might actually be able to fix it to where it defaults to the right one, but this is the place that you can choose the right object code. Once you've chosen the right one here, the rest follow you, okay? So that's the reason that one got messed up in particular, is that they just kind of weren't paying attention to it and just left it. And sometimes Tippy might actually be paid to travel out of state for us to actually do a training at some kind of seminar or conference thing for us, specifically for VR. Um, but that's just one of those things you guys are gonna have to kind of watch for too. And it's on the very beginning screen, okay? Is that the same place they put in their notes for all that other stuff yes. too, right? Yes, okay. And advances too, like if you're needing to get um, credit for an advance for somebody, you gotta put that in here. Right. I don't know if y'all have ever paid attention to that, but that's where it is. Um, okay. And speaking to um, Ivy's question about going off and on per diem, when they go off per diem, that's the time we need to know the date, and then it says, would say, traveler off state time, and you would put that time there. Now, is your person coming back on state time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you take them off per diem, off state time, and you put your time there, that doesn't mean that you can quit putting um, anything next. In fact, the very next line, you put down the next day. If they're on uh, their own personal time that day, you say off per diem or on personal time. The next day, you go ahead and put it down to on personal time. When they come back on per diem, we need to know the date, and you say to us on back on per diem, 
and then you tell us the time of day that they come back on for them. From that point, we go to the end, I guess, and you'll give us a date and a time that they're going to be, you know, arriving here. Again. So those those on and off per diems are, I know they must be hard, very difficult for um, assistance to process. I know that that must be a nightmare because it's a nightmare when it gets to us trying to figure out times and trying to understand what's going on. You know, and it's okay that people go off and on for them. It's okay. Um, but it still has to be indicated accurately or we can never move it on to the next level until we can get it to make, meet that standard of moving on. Um, <clears throat> So I've, I've written myself a note list each single day. Don't wait until the day they go back on for them and then put that day down. Single days. Um, also put in the notes section, um, Ivy, and I don't know if you even know this part now, but say that when they come back on state for them or you know, state time, are they going to just keep the car then on their personal car, or are they going to go back and put it on the P card again? Um, actually, I don't know. Um, but is that what you suggested? No. <laughs> oh, no, I would not. Okay. No. no, it would actually be easier for you guys, and, you know, and the audit process. If they just left it on their personal car, but if they do that, then, you know, then they're going to start with mileage. So I guess whatever works for them. But um, it, it really does get rough. I'm sorry, Brenda. Could you repeat that, what you just said again, um, about leaving it on their own and then yeah. doing mileage? If, well, see, if they leave if they have it. a rental vehicle? Well, a rental vehicle, they couldn't do. Right, but okay. But a rental vehicle, they still, they then got to go in. Right. And they've got to justify and they've mean? got to explain why they're keeping it. Right. You know, I mean, to let me just tell you folks something. If you know you're going to go off and on for them, I mean, I, none, none of us do that. But if, if your person knows they're going to go off and on for them, it is so much easier if they would just use their personal card to rent their vehicle, etc. You know? Now, if they can't do it, they can't do it. But... That's the easiest as far as getting it onto the paper and through the audit process. But those aren't my calls. Okay. Another thing I want to uh, talk about, this is as good a place as any. Um, hotel. Do y'all know the word consolidator? Does anybody, is anybody familiar with that word? Okay, a consolidator is a company like Travelocity, Ex, um, Expedia, Hotels.com. Those are consolidators. They purchase a block of rooms from hotels and they purchase them at quite a small price. Then an unsuspecting traveler will go on and some, some travelers try to use, well, use Priceline, some use um, different, different ones, but they book their hotel through one of these consolidators thinking, oh, I've done a great thing because I've gotten a less expensive um, hotel. However, the trouble herein lies that when you try to check out of that hotel, you will not get a receipt. There is no receipt. You didn't pay the Ramada in for your lodging. You paid Expedia or whoever, Hotels.com. That's who you paid. They will not give your traveler a receipt. You will not be able to call back down to that hotel and get a receipt. 
It doesn't exist. They'll have some stuff out on the internet, but what, what a receipt requires for a hotel is the name and address of the hotel, um, you know, and their phone number and their fax number. Um, it requires that person's name and address, etc. The date they checked in, the date they checked out, uh, what room number they were in. Mm, those are just the ones I can remember off the top of my head. But all of that has to be on our receipts from hotels. But if you use a consolidator, we will not have any of that. And so then your traveler will have to um, explain a lot. They'll just have to explain a lot. And y'all will have to be the ones going and intermediating um, for us to get that information to us. So um, if y'all are the ones who actually call and make these reservations, just uh, even if you go out and look at a consolidator and see where their prices are, fine. Let that be it. You either come back to the beginning and go on the hotel website or you call the hotel and make their reservations that way. But don't use a consolidator. Debbie. I'm thinking that out-of-state travel is still still has to go through the commissioner. Correct. And it requires an additional memo on top of the standard black travel docs. Okay, that's what I had in my notes, and uh, I just wanted to double check and make sure that's true. Not that we have any, but we do. <laughs> shake so badly and I'm sorry um, and I can't really tell it looks like it's 25920 something it like that mm -hmm. and out to the right it says PCA and in parentheses you see that person's number those numbers are the ones that are assigned to a person who has a disability who goes through the proper channels of getting um, an ADA number, but no, nowhere on this voucher do you see the word ADA. And you should never see the word ADA attached to, there, there's a name up under that fish, but the word, the, the phrase ADA should never be shown on a person's voucher. You put, this person needed a PCA during the time that they were here in Tallahassee advocating for the legislature. And the only thing that's there is the amount, PCA, and that number. That number may not mean anything to anybody, and that's okay, it's not supposed to. But even in the state comptroller's office, they know that number, and they know what that number represents. On your C676C for this person, again, that number is all that's there. That number protects that person from their identity. You never want to be so insensitive that you write or that you type in ADA number 
is, that can cause significant uh, problems uh, because a person who has disabilities or a disability has confidentiality uh, written all over them and their stuff. Okay? So be very sensitive about that anytime that you work with somebody who does have a PCA or any accommodation. If it's um, like Nancy was talking about um, larger vehicles, if they get a larger vehicle because they need that and they have a number, you don't say anything about for an ADA accommodation. You simply put that number on their travel voucher. That's all there is said about it. That's all that should be said about it. I see it a lot. And I cringe every time that I see that, that phrase. And of course, we all know Americans with Disabilities Act is what ADA stands for. And that gives, that provides um, those persons with the ability to travel that they would not normally otherwise have, okay? So we want to be um, continually aware and sensitive and, um, you know, just, just always, even if you've got to talk to somebody, when I'm on the phone dealing with a person who has uh, a need, I work very, diligently to make sure that my words are sensitive because we all know that we work in cubicle environments. Uh, so I, I speak very carefully understanding that that person on the other end needs that. They need for me to protect their identity. Because for some people to be singled out person with a disability. It's very painful. So if that happens to somebody, um, let's treat them with um, sensitivity. Let them know that what we're doing is health in the strictest and highest. Ways to avoid stress on our trips and their trips. Um, the receipts, we've already talked about that. Gasoline receipts, please, folks. Uh, let's keep up with gasoline receipts. And there's, um, you all know that in the um, travel, uh, travel uh, manual, over where it talks about, and I don't remember the page number, but there's a space in there that talks about mandatory receipts. And Charlotte and I got off on this the other day um, about finding that specific wording. And it, it is there in the, the receipts that are required. So we do have to have receipts um, for gasoline, for your Avis vehicles, etc. you know, Avis vehicles. Um, if they, if a person chooses valet parking at a hotel, they have to um, indicate that it is mandatory uh, unless they have a number. Acronyms, uh, we still get lots of those. Please use a legend to explain all of those. Um, be careful with object codes. We've talked about that. We've talked about the magic phrase. And here it is in your handouts today. Um, we talked about the sensitivity and the confidentiality. That that will um, certainly reduce stress if we can if we can do that. Um, any questions so far?
something that I've heard several times through the years that um, they're working on a new travel manual. Is that still in the in the works? Or I mean, I would still use the same one we had, but I, I understand they were updating, making changes. Miss Pam. Yes, ma'am. Um, it is in Miss Champion's office for her review still. Um, it is supposed to still take place, but we do not know when. Certainly not here in the legislature, I would imagine. They're so busy with the legislature. Exactly. So it is going to be a while. So, yeah. um, he was hoping, um, um, the comptroller was hoping to get it processed pretty quickly once we completed it, but that did not happen. So it's kind of, now it's kind of a waiting game. Because we were trying to hold off to have this travel training until we have the new documents um, and updated so we can give you new information, but we were not able to do that. We didn't want to hold you back any longer, so we just decided to go forward with the the old information, the original information that we have. Um, something I'm seeing sticking out at me right now is social security numbers. We get a lot of um, we get a lot of um, vouchers without social security numbers on them. I realize that's sensitive information, but we can't get it into FLIR without it. But, mm -hmm. So, uh, just... If you have an employee that you are not just now noticing that does not have a Social Security number showing up on the printed voucher, then you need to get with somebody in IT. If it's out in the field, it needs to be an IT person there. If it's up here, it needs to be me. Um, what has happened is that they don't give us those numbers anymore for new employees. It was something that the Auditor General said we weren't in compliance with because we had those forms um, sometimes on our desk and not locked up. So they won't let anybody put them on there anymore. So we have to literally pick up the phone and request a social security number. So it's possible that during that time when a brand new person got added, that their social security number did not get added. And if that happens, then it causes a problem for Brenda, because Brenda's gotta find it, okay? And then it's never gonna be on there if you don't get it corrected by somebody in IT. And we have to actually add it into the rooms program, because that's where it pulls its information from. And once we get it added in, then it'll show up the next time. But there are a handful of people who just, it was just a mistake, people got left off occasionally if they didn't know that they had to request that by phone. And there's not a handful that yeah, Miami a lot, is yeah. full of them. Nearly yeah. every, I mean, nearly every week we're getting stuff from Miami. You know, it's a lot of turnover, I guess. And that needs to go they through Molly Diaz and yeah. she needs to put them in. So. Right. So I always email them back and I tell them, cannot process this out of social security number. I also copy Lally Diaz and I tell her, tell them, and while I'm telling her, uh, please call Lally, tell her your social security number because they will not accept it in an email. We know why, right? Those are public documents. Call Lally, she will enter it for you, she will take care of everything, and that's the way it is all out in the field. Here it may be uh, you know, cared for differently, but that's how it is in the field. But we cannot pay people without social security numbers. So make sure that that's there. Um, any other questions or answers? <laughs> we can do some answers too, so. Is it okay, I sometimes get um, questions from people, oh, when am I getting my reimbursement? And I just, re I refer them to you, I just basically say, I don't know how mm -hmm. it's been submitted. If you have questions, contact you, is that okay? Mm -hmm. or, I just give them your email. Yeah, or they can look at Flair. Because um, when we audit it, we enter it um, within the third day, unless it got um, sampled or audited, whatever word you want to use. By the third day, they can see in Flare when it will post to their account. Okay. Um, that, but not everybody has access to Flare. Yeah. Yeah. Your payroll. Comptrollers. Okay. They could look at the Comptrollers website. Well, that's Flare. Some people don't know what they're doing. Oh, okay. I didn't know. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. 
where, where you look for your payroll, that's where you can see mm -hmm. your travel payment. And that's what it, well, I don't remember that it says, it says reimbursement. Mm -hmm. So instead of clicking on employee earnings, they will click on employee reimbursements. And voila, it's right there where you look for, where you look for the payroll. Okay. Yeah. So, and if they don't want to do that, then okay, yeah, they can call me and I'll tell them the same thing. <laughs> but that's okay, certain, I'll look. Is there a certain time frame maybe? Like if she gets the phone call two days after she's turned it in, can she just say, you know, it takes so long to process it? before you need to check on it again. Yeah. Like, is there a certain time frame that we could give them? Well, see, we don't know how long ago it might have left Catherine or how long it actually took. You know, I, Lord only knows where the mail goes from Catherine to me. I, mean, I don't scared. know. And on any given day, <laughs> we don't know yet. Um, but anyway, no, when I'm saying three days, what I mean is when we audit it and input it for to create their EFT. Then from that date of audit and entry, three days later, unless it's some um, sampled, they um, they should be able to tell. But I will tell you this, if it happens to be like this whole page, this whole schedule of people on the same voucher that that person got audited on, nobody gets paid until that <laughs> one gets paid, you know, until we clear that one up. So. We don't like that part of the process, but it's definitely a part of the process. Bad. <laughs> All right, anything else? You've been an awesome group. I love it over here. <laughs> Just love it, but, um, but I, I'm thankful for each one of you for your parts in the process. I'm truly thankful that you, you know, that you wanted to know that, um, that means a lot to me that you want to know how to prepare your stuff well. Y'all do a great job. You, you truly do um, a great job. I don't know how that pool works that y'all have, but it works. So y'all just keep up the good work. And if you have questions, let me know. I'll be always happy to answer them. And um, Pamela or Winfrey, if you guys decide that y'all want to do an actual hands-on travel thing here for the program, then just request it through me and we'll set something up. Um, I don't know that y'all use it as much as we do over here. Over here, we're required to use it. It just, because it, it prints out a very nice voucher and it does actually do some tracking on the other side, but anyway, that's beside the point. But I don't know, but we're not allowed to use the um, Excel spreadsheet over here. That would be one thing I'd say to Catherine, is, um, um, question is that if they call and they say the travel program says I haven't been paid for the last three times I've traveled when when they say the word travel program you automatically know that they don't have the latest information but they do have to look at, at the state controller or something player whatever their website is okay because it doesn't it was meant to reconcile between this and player and somehow, you know, the baby just got mixed up with the bath water and <laughs> whatever. But anyway, enjoy having each one of you. Thank you for coming.